Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'll just give it a minute while people get their um, microphones and everything sorted out. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Maureen will be adding a question in there. Uh, if you want to engage with that, we'd be happy to hear from you and, you know, where you're joining from today. Okay, looks like everybody's settled. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate works towards an ATE community in which evaluation is valued, systematic, and used to improve the education of technicians in high-tech fields. We do this through engaging project leaders and evaluators with information, expertise, and tools to advance high-quality evaluation. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already available on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. You may also download those resources by following the link on the right side of your screen, and the recording will be available within a couple of days, and we'll email that directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa wilson Betcho is our presenter today. She's the principal investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to recognize those who work behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including Maureen Green, who's with us today for technical support in the chat, and Lori Wingate from the Evaluate team. We also want to thank Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for their input in helping us make this webinar. And finally, we always thank Carolyn williams Norin, our copy editor. Before we get started, I do want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I'm going to hand it over to Lissa. Thanks, Samantha. Hello, everyone. I am so glad to be here with you all today to talk about evaluation. Um, I am so thankful to the Mentor Connect program for all that they do for ATE and just really glad that they have us come and speak to all of the Mentor Connect cohorts about what is evaluation and what should you do. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our cameras for now so that you can focus on the slides, but we are going to turn them back on during our question and answer breaks. So remember, we're going to have lots of time to answer questions. So if you have a question at any point throughout the webinar, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, and Samantha and Maureen on the back end will tag it and bring it back up when we take a break. All right, so we have a lot to talk about in the next hour. But I want to begin today by checking in with you because often we find that people um, bring some assumptions, some feelings, frankly, some baggage with them into conversations about evaluation. And that's completely fair. I just want to know what you're all bringing in with you to today's webinar. So using the chat box on the right side of your screen that you're all introducing yourself with, share one word that comes to mind when you hear the term evaluation. So just one word, no judgments, don't hold back, good, bad, I want to hear it. Okay, so Valerie says rating, Brian says test, Erica says decisions, Adrian has impact, it's a good one, Mara says assessment, Donna says validation, relationship, anxiety, pressure, data, another assessment, analysis. Yeah, these are all good ones. Metrics. So there are some words in there that we kind of associate with the process of evaluation, right? Like data or analysis, metrics, outcomes. That's a good one, Donna. Um, there are some words in here that sometimes get confused with evaluation. So the difference between assessment and evaluation would be a good distinction to revisit. But I also hear some emotions in there, right? Anxiety, stress, pressure, right? Well, all of those are completely fair and acceptable associations. But I will tell you right now that I have one primary goal for today, and that is to have you all walk away with a more hopeful and positive outlook on what program evaluation can do for you and why you want to partner with your evaluation team for the sake of your students, your faculty, and your project. So many of you today might be like my friend Jen here. So meet Jen Jenerickson. 
note, this is a fictional character and project. Any resemblance to actual persons or projects is coincidental. So she has a great idea for an ATU proposal. She's working with her colleagues to pull together specifics about her activities and her work plan. She's reading the AT solicitation when she comes across the section on evaluation. So it states that all ATE funded work must be evaluated, but she's never had an NSF grant before and she's not entirely sure what this means. In fact, she has a lot of questions like what even is evaluation? Why should she do it? How much is it going to cost her project? Who can serve as that evaluator? And where can she find that person? So in today's webinar, I wanna answer all of these questions. And again, any other questions that come up for you along the way. So two quick caveats before we jump in. So first, today is part one of a two-part series of evaluation webinars for Mentor Connect. So today is gonna to be an intro, kind of like a overview, like a quick start guide to what you need to know about evaluation as a prospective grantee, grants professional or administrator. And then on March 27th in part two, we're gonna dive into some more of the details and specifics about how precisely to write an evaluation plan for your AT proposal. So in both webinars, I wanna connect you back to the wealth of resources on the Evaluate website so that when you inevitably have a question about evaluation later on in your proposal development, you know where to find the answers. So caveat number two, um, the current solicitation uh, is expired, right? So a new solicitation will be released ahead of this year's ATE submission deadline in October. Um, I know that you have all heard this from Mentor Connect already. Uh, while we do expect to see some changes in the solicitation, um, the inf most of the information about evaluation that we share with you today won't really be impacted. So while the specific wording may change in the solicitation, the general um, value that NSF has for evaluation, the, their respect for its importance for the project improvement uh, will not be changing. So you can rest assured that and evaluate as soon as the new solicitation comes out, we'll have additional resources really translating the evaluation guidance in that new solicitation that you'll receive as well. So let's start with the most fundamental question of what is evaluation? Well, at its core, evaluation is a process of learning. Program evaluation can help to answer questions like, did my project work? Why did it work? Who did it work for? Are there project implications um, for the impacts being equitable? Uh, what aspects can be improved? And what should we do differently in the future? So the learning from an evaluation should be driven by you, the project staff, and those served by the project. This might be people like the students you serve, maybe faculty you engage with, or business and industry partners. So we'll continue to talk about this, but the best evaluations are a partnership between the project team and the evaluation team. Your evaluators are there to be your partners in learning. They're not there to catch you doing something wrong. They're not there to mark you down or point out your flaws. They're not auditors. They're not there to conduct a performance review. They're there to work with you to make your project better and for the sake of your project and ultimately your students. So there are no failed projects. Just like in any science experiment, there are no bad data. All data are a chance for learning, for improvement. Unmet project goals are an opportunity to understand what didn't work. And knowing what doesn't work is a step closer to knowing what does work. Okay, so what does this really look like in practice? Well, boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. First, asking important questions about a project's processes, outcomes, or other dimensions. This is, this is about making sure that the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter. So this is where your project's learning desires come in. These questions really scope the rest of your evaluation. The next step is gathering evidence that will help answer those questions. So evidence for evaluation is often gathered using research methods like focus groups, interviews, surveys, or even observations. 
In ATE projects, evaluations, they often utilize a college's institutional data. Um, some data may come from course evaluations, or sometimes data for an evaluation in an ATE project includes feedback from panels of experts or advisors. Next, we have to make sense of that data that we collected. So we interpret the results and then formulate answers to the evaluation questions. So when it comes to interpreting and making meaning of the data that were collected, evaluations almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or extent of the outcome, as well as their practical significance for the people involved. This is often done by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. And then the final step is to use the information for project improvement, accountability, and planning. The use of evaluation findings for decision making is a key part of the evaluation cycle. So I said final step, but this isn't really the final step because evaluation should inform decisions about the next project. And this cycle of learning starts all over again. So now Jen has a better sense of what it means to, oops, I like that I just skipped a slide. <laughs> uh, so now that Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her projects evaluated, um, she's still unsure of why she should do it. So why should she evaluate her project? Why should she want to evaluate her project? So I said it before and I'll say it again, evaluation is all about learning. We typically talk about three main benefits that come from evaluations. First, learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. Second, sharing those learnings back with NSF. So as your funder, NSF also wants to learn what changes have happened because of their investment in your project. And third, providing evidence of the effectiveness of your project, both for your project and for others who are trying to do similar things. Evidence of what works can add to the larger field of technician training. So let's look at the first purpose, improvement. A maxim we frequently hear is that the most important purpose for evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. Whereas research is typically conducted for the sake of building knowledge, evaluation is intended to inform decision-making. So the first purpose of evaluation is for improvement in decision-making. Utility or the usefulness of an evaluation is actually a standard of quality which evaluations are judged. Evaluation findings are intended to be used. But what does that really mean, evaluations should be used? Well, let's look at some examples of how evaluations might be used in ATE projects. So in our first example, evaluation findings, they may may have highlighted a particularly effective recruitment strategy for women in a cybersecurity program. So the project decides to lean into the success and shift additional resources to that recruitment strategy. In a second example, the project evaluator might share that faculty in a professional development workshop, they had a particularly difficult time understanding a particular unit on semiconductors. So this is a red flag that indicates the project might want to revisit that unit and provide additional instructions. For a final example, evaluators can be particularly important in highlighting issues of equity and inclusion around a project's impact. So an internship program funded by a project might be particularly helpful for white students, but Hispanic students who participated say that they, feel, they don't feel a sense of belonging and can't fully engage with the industry partners. So evaluation can unearth these patterns and give you an understanding of what you might change in your project and why. So let's go on to purpose number two, accountability. So as the future funder of your project, NSF does require an independent evaluation. In order to be in compliance with the requirement of your ATE grant, you must evaluate your project. Just like you want to learn about the effectiveness of your project, so does NSF. So at a basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. Individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources and information helps NSF be accountable to Congress and justify the continued support of the ATE program. 
So projects funded by NSF have to submit reports annually through a system called research.gov. The main report sections are shown here across the top in the little blue boxes. So in the accomplishment section, grantees report on their project goals, activities, results, and outcomes. Evidence of your project's results and outcomes, those are gonna come in large part from your evaluation. So your program officer will expect you to upload your evaluation report in this section, but they're also looking for you to react to your evaluation findings. They want to know what you learned and how you use that information. If you make any types of changes in your project activities, you can note that here. Um, you can also have a discussion with your project or your program officer about it. But your evaluation findings are one way that you can justify those changes, right? So if you encounter problems or you have an opportunity to shift a project's focus, um, substantiating those changes in your original plan can be included in this section and can really come from your evaluation findings. So it's really helpful to know what NSF will expect from your reporting, even at the proposal stage, because knowing what you'll be asked for in the future will allow you to prepare for that now. So the third purpose of evaluation is for evidence. So we hear a lot about evidence-based practices or high impact practices. And we trust that systematic research and evaluation of these efforts have provided evidence that they work. So just as you borrow from others' successful interventions, one day someone else might borrow from yours. Your evaluation provides evidence of what works and what doesn't, both equally important learning opportunities. Additionally, you will need evidence of your project's outcomes if you apply for your next NSF grant in the future. So when you go back to NSF in a few years to request funding for a new project, you'll have to begin your proposal with a section called results from prior NSF support. So this subsection has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of the project's activities. Again, these come from your evaluation. So it's important to consider at the start of your project, your one right now, that what kind of evidence you might want to have at the end of that project. Let's look at some examples of what that evidence might be. So here are three sets of statements that could show up in a results of prior support section in a future proposal that Jen submits. So take your time to read these examples carefully and then answer the poll on the right side of your screen to indicate which examples would be the most compelling to reviewers as evidence of outcomes. So Samantha launched the poll. You can find it in the poll tab on the right side of your screen. And I'll stay quiet for about 60 seconds to allow you time to read this. Looks like we have responses from a majority of our audience. And most people chose example C. A vast majority of people chose example C. So let's go ahead and look at each one of these examples more closely. So in example A, it really only said what the project was funded to do. 
So Celeste Carter, the ATE program lead, says this is actually pretty common in ATE proposals that people kind of cut and paste from their prior proposal. So this isn't really compelling evidence of outcomes. Looking at example B, it only reported on activities. So it includes a lot of numbers, right? 150 students enrolled, 300 students benefited, 400 potential students. Those numbers sound great, but they're just counts of what happened. There really isn't any evidence of what happened to the students as a result of those activities. So looking at example C, the answer, this really answers the question of, so what? So what happened to those students after they participated? Well, their pass rates increased, they got jobs. It includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So this kind of example is really what you wanna aim for. So now think about your own proposal. So imagine your proposal is successful and you're funded in the fall. You've been funded for an NSF ATE program. So imagine you're now in the last year of that ATE project. What is one thing that you want to be able to say about the success of your project? So what's one piece of evidence that you want to be able to say about the success of your project? So take a minute to think about what that one thing would be and share it in the chat box on the right side of your screen. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of hard to think about, right? So we have a few answers coming in, right? Teresita said employability, right? So I'm hoping that means the increase of student employability, right? Deborah said, how many students were employed? I see a few that are that are still that have like number of students earning degrees. And we want to make sure that we're we're really thinking beyond that, right? It's not just about did they get the degree, but once they got the degree, what were they able to do with that in the world, right? Were they able to get a job which paid more, fulfill employment needs? They have increasing awareness of field and enrollment in programs, increasing diversity of students enrolled in the program, change in success rate of students hired after successful internships, industry is more satisfied with safety preparedness of students, Completers become employed in industry. Yeah, these are all really great ones. So remember to keep all of those in mind as you're thinking about not only planning your project and what you want that end goal to be, but also as you're planning your evaluation, thinking about how your evaluation is gonna work with your project to make sure that you have that type of evidence. So, I mentioned that I wanted to connect you with the number of resources that Evaluate has. So I believe that at your winter workshop, you all received kind of a booklet of resources from Evaluate. Um, so maybe you have the physical one in front of you. If you wanna download a digital one, you can download it in the handout section, um, little tab that says handouts on the right side of your screen. But within there on page eight, you will see this, uh, guidance on what goes into that results and prior support section. So we have a checklist on this topic and it includes the NSF requirements plus our suggestions of getting the most out of this section of your proposal. So even if you're just thinking about submitting your first NSF proposal, which I know many of you are, it's not too early to think about how you want to be able to talk about your accomplishments with this project in the future. So now that Jen has a good grasp of what evaluation is, what it looks like in practice and why she might wanna do it, but her big question is what is it going to cost her project? So we're gonna dive into that question in just a second, but I wanna take a minute to hand it over to Samantha for a question break. So any and all questions that you might have at this point, please share them in the chat. Thank you, Lissa. We don't have any right now, but I'm sure, you know, we'll give it a, a minute here in case anybody wants to enter one in, uh, 
we can address it. You know, there was something earlier that I made a note to come back to and this idea of what is the difference between assessment and evaluation? Um, because they are different things. I think they are certainly related. So assessment, you typically hear uh, a lot in education, right? Student assessments. Um, so normally you hear assessment being used when it's about collecting data on student learning. So often assessments can be part of an evaluation, but when you're thinking about a project level evaluation, those outcomes may be at a higher level than just learning. So like we talked about with those pieces of evidence of, of impact or outcomes, right? What happens because of that learning? Okay, and we have our first question from Donna. Is it better to have an external evaluator help with preparing the section? Absolutely. Donna, that's a great question. If you are able to, having an external evaluator on board as soon as possible is always going to benefit you because it means that you get to strengthen your relationship with that evaluator. But that evaluator can also help not only write a really strong evaluation plan for your proposal, but evaluators think about program theory and outcomes all day, every day, right? So they're also a really great reviewer of your proposal and can help think through some of these um, concepts with you as you're developing your, your work plan. So we're gonna talk about what that means a little bit more later in this webinar and definitely more in the next one. Okay, and how do grantees establish the baseline measures for their evaluation? Jason, such a great question. I love this question. Um, I am actually gonna ask if Maureen can find a link to a webinar that Evaluate gave last December around interpreting evaluation findings. So often, right, so we had the, the different steps and one of them particularly was interpretation, right? So if you end up with a finding that says, um, you know, 25 students graduated from this program, great, but is that good or is that bad? Like you have no baseline or comparison to make that judgment of whether it's good or bad, right? So you want that baseline or you want a comparison. So there are a number of different areas that you can get this from, right? So you can talk about uh, temporal baselines, right? So over time, what happened a year before the program, two years, five years, you might reach out to your institutional research office to get this data. Um, you might be able to get some employment data from publicly available data sets. Um, you could also look at doing some type of comparison uh, between groups that are at your actual institution. So maybe students who are engaging in the ATE activities and some that aren't, you can make that comparison. Um, but if, if Maureen can't find it, I'm gonna pull it up because we have a whole webinar on talking about what those strategies are. And I think that would be really helpful. Oh, perfect. See, she's right on it. Okay, Lisa, and that is our all of our questions for now. So I think we're ready to move on. Wonderful, thank you all. And we will have uh, two more question breaks. So make sure to throw any questions that pop up in the chat. All right. So now on to the question that I think we probably get the most frequently at this stage in the proposal development process of how much is this going to cost, right? So here's an excerpt from the ATE program solicitation about the evaluation requirements. And it states that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. So that's certainly important, but it's not very satisfying for people who just want to get a figure into their budget that they can really work with. So a general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's cost should be allocated for evaluation. And that's evaluation in any context. So that's a really good place to start. And then you can go up or down from there, depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. So, there are a variety of factors that can really influence a project evaluations budget. So let's look at some of those factors. So first is the type of data that the evaluation will be collecting. So qualitative data tends to be more time intensive when it comes to data collection, cleaning, and analysis. 
Therefore, evaluations that more heavily rely on qualitative data may be more expensive. Whether the data has already been collected or whether it will be new, so existing data may be less time consuming for the evaluation team. So compared to when they need to gather data, like brand new data, making new data more expensive. Different evaluators interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who will be highly responsive to the changes in activities, timelines, or data needs, that might be more costly than something that's a bit more rigid or less responsive. And then the level of engagement from your evaluator, right? So an evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision-making is gonna be more costly due to that time commitment than someone who's not. There are elements of support that project staff could really aid in evaluation efforts. So more project support can reduce the burden on your external evaluator, making a less costly evaluation. And finally, we have time, uh, travel time, right? The, the distance that an evaluator may have to travel to do a site visit can also affect your evaluation budget. So you might wanna consider how far your evaluator will have to travel for meetings or site visits. Um, longer travel times may lead to a higher evaluation budget. But you know we're seeing this change after COVID, right? We're seeing more evaluators be okay with a virtual site visit rather than um, an in-person one. So I wanna share these trade-offs, not as a formula to write an evaluation budget, but as some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule might be affected by the type of evaluation that your project is looking for. So it's best to have an open conversation with your evaluator about your needs and their needs. So the fact of the matter is, if evaluation is gonna bring value to your project, you have to fund it adequately. So let's look at what this might mean in practice. So remember our friend Jen, well, let's say that she's going to ask for the maximum amount for a project funded through the new small to ATE program track. So her total project budget would be $350,000. So most academic institutions apply an indirect cost, sometimes called a facilities and administration rate. But all institutions' indirect rates are different. But let's say for this example that Jen's institutional indirect rate is 25%. So that means that $70,000 of her total budget would be made up of indirect funds, leaving $280,000 of the budget for direct operating funds. So this 10% rule for evaluation is calculated based on the direct operating budget. So if Jen decides to dedicate 10% of her direct operating budget to evaluation, that would mean that there would be $28,000 over the span of the grant, which would be $9,333 per year. So these funds are going to go towards your evaluator's time, as well as their travel expenses and overhead costs. There may be some other miscellaneous costs in there, but these are the main ones. An evaluation budget should really reflect what's needed for a given project. So again, this is a really rough guideline. So Jen is on her way to understanding what evaluation is and how much it'll cost. And we're gonna tackle her next question about who can evaluate her ATE project. But first, I know that there are, tend to be a lot of questions about evaluation budgets. So we've placed a really short question break here before we move on, just to make sure there aren't any lingering questions about how much an evaluation will cost. All right, not yet. No, not yet. Okay, that's a good thing. All right, we'll dive back in then. So the next section is about who can do this evaluation. So Jen, she has a lot of smart people on her team. So she's wondering if they can just do it internally. And the short answer to that question is no, because the ATE program specify, specifically states that the evaluator must be independent of the project. 
So the first question we should tackle is what counts as independent and why aren't we using the term external? So according to the ATE program solicitation, the program off, the, sorry, the, the evaluator may be employed by a project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit that has a different reporting line than the project's home unit. This could be a different academic unit or institutional research office. While some larger institutions might have the evaluation capacity in other departments, this can become practically impossible at smaller institutions. NSF asks for the evaluator to be independent in order to provide a sense of objectivity and validity to the findings. Sometimes you're just gonna need to do a gut check. Can this person objectively evaluate my project? Will there be any incentive for them to sway the results one way or another? If you're on the fence, it's better to go with someone outside your institution. So here is why it is stated as independent instead of external, because there may be situations in which you might be able to employ an external, uh, an independent evaluator who is technically internal to your college. But again, that's so hard to do with small colleges. So typically we recommend that you do go external to your college, look at the big wide world and all the evaluators that are outside of there because an evaluator from outside of your institution and project has the highest level of independence. They'll really be able to tell you like it is without any political ramifications. So it can feel really difficult to find an evaluator that's right for your project. Small new to ATE projects can be particularly tricky. When looking for an evaluator, it's important to know that there are no specific degrees or certifications that are required to call yourself an evaluator. So there are a wide variety of companies and organizations that conduct project evaluations. Some are small evaluation consultants and others are large evaluation centers. So here are some things that you might want to look for when searching for an evaluator. So you want to look, you want to be careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator, someone who has strong research skills, is a good communicator, and who will be responsive to your situation. It can also be helpful for someone to have an understanding of NSF or of two-year colleges in particular. For new ATE projects, it can be really helpful to have an evaluator that has prior experience evaluating an ATE project. It's not always easy to find someone with a perfect mix of credentials based solely on their resume, but let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So as Samantha launches the poll for this question, take a moment to review the credentials of these three evaluators then use the poll that should appear on the right side of your screen to make your recommendation about which one Jen should approach for her project. If you have any reservations about your suggestion or additional questions that you might ask this evaluator, use the chat to explain any of your concerns. So I'm gonna give you a minute to read these three mini evaluator bios. can always tell when people are taking their time and thinking about a question because the, the response is coming pretty slow. Right now, it looks like we have about half of our participants who have answered the poll. And of those, 22 of you are choosing evaluator B. Another seven are choosing evaluator C. And we only have a few choosing evaluator A. Adrian in the chat says, concern with evaluator B would be ensuring they had bandwidth to take on another evaluation project. 
yeah, they look pretty busy, right? They're currently the lead evaluator for 25 NSF funded projects. Yeah. All right, still looking like most of you are choosing B. So let, let's look at each of these. So if we look at evaluator A, oops, went too fast. Okay, if we look at evaluator A, they seem to have good, good knowledge of two-year colleges, technical education, and student services. So I would want to know more about their experiences as an external evaluator of grant-funded projects. Accreditation, you know, it has a lot in common with project evaluation, but it's not quite the same thing. So like we said, sometimes it's difficult to tell if an evaluator is a good fit from their resume alone. So you might have to ask some follow-up questions to get a good sense of things. So evaluator B looks like they have great credentials when it comes to evaluation, but like Adrian said, and Rachel uh, said as well in the chat that we would really wanna know how much time they would really have to work with this project, given that they're working on 25 other evaluations. I would suspect, suspect that they have a team working with them. So I'd also wanna know who exactly would be working with this project and what their credentials are. They say that they have prior experience with NSF funded projects. I would ask them if they have experience with ATE in particular. Evaluator C certainly knows two-year colleges and NSF, but it's not clear if they have any expertise when it comes to research methods and running evaluations. So I would make sure to ask about those two things. It's really rare to find a perfect evaluator based on their online profile or resume alone. So it's always good to follow up with questions and ask for additional information. So to help with this, we pulled together a list of questions that you might want to ask an evaluator when determining which is the right fit for you. So you can find this on page seven of your booklet. An evaluator should fit your project and your team in multiple ways. So not only with their skills in evaluation, but also their working style, how they approach the evaluation. The more you feel connected with your evaluator, the better potential for the evaluation. So now Jen has a better idea of who she might be looking for, but where does she look? So Evaluate has done some research around this, and we found that most AT projects actually find their evaluator through word of mouth. So make sure to ask your colleagues and other AT PIs you know if they have an evaluator that they like, but I know that the answer isn't helpful for everyone. Unfortunately, Evaluate doesn't currently have a master list of all possible evaluators for your ATE project. However, we do have some good suggestions on where you might find an evaluator that meets your needs. So first, the American Evaluation Association hosts a national directory of evaluators. So you can search by areas of expertise or even by location. For ATE projects, we suggest using search terms such as STEM, education, community college, or even NSF. There are also local affiliates of the American Evaluation Association. So these regional groups sometimes have their own directory, which may list people who are not included on the national directory. While an evaluator does not have to does not have to be local to your area, sometimes it can cut down on the travel costs like we talked about in the budget section. Or it can also increase their awareness of your local needs. Expanding the Bench is an initiative committed to diversifying evaluation and, evaluate and elevating culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. They also host a searchable database of evaluators. So similar to the AEA database, we recommend ATE projects use search terms like STEM, education, community college, or NSF. Finally, ATE Central hosts a map of evaluators who are currently evaluating ATE projects. So these evaluator profiles will list information such as their company name, their contact information, their location, as well as the ATE projects and disciplines that they've evaluated before. Some will even indicate whether or not they're accepting new clients. So when you get to the stage where you're ready to find and select an evaluator for your project, take a look at Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator. 
So this is a really great summary of all of the information that I've given to you today and more. All of this guidance on finding an evaluator really assumes that you're able to start looking for an evaluator now before you've been funded. But this process of procuring an evaluator can be a bit more difficult depending on your institution's policies. I wish I could give you a straightforward map about what this looks like at your institution, but it is different in each state and sometimes between each institution. So we recommend that one of your first conversations is with someone in your procurement or contracts office. So, so they should really be able to tell you the specifics at your institution. But there are two basic paths. So in the first path, your institution will allow you to work with an evaluator pre-award, meaning right now, while you're developing your proposal. So this can be a really great way to connect with your evaluator and get their insights and feedback on not only the evaluation plan, but on your project's goals and objectives. Evaluators spend a lot of time thinking about what constitutes meaningful outcomes and how to measure them. So in this situation, evaluators, many evaluators, they'll actually conduct this work upfront without payment. So they work with the agreement that they will be hired as the evaluator for your project if you receive the grant. But make sure you talk to them upfront about how they handle these situations and what kind of boundaries they might place around their time or efforts in the pre-award stage. In the second path, your institution might say that you need to wait until your project is funded in order to work with an evaluator. They might require that you actually put your evaluation up to bid, meaning that you, you have this open request for proposal process. So this means that you'll not be able to work with an external evaluator to write your evaluation plan for your proposal. You or someone else on your project team will need to write it. While this may seem really overwhelming, know that a lot of other ATE projects are in a similar boat and that Evaluate has resources that can support you. So first, Evaluate developed a resource that looks at navigating the evaluator procurement process. So we hope that this guide can give you an overview of what this process looks like and some directions on what to ask your institutional procurement office. Second, Evaluate has a checklist for what content should be included in your evaluation plan for your ATE proposal. So this is exactly the information that we're gonna dive into in our next webinar on March 27th. But I wanna give you this checklist now in case you are getting ready to get started. So know that we are gonna talk through every bullet point on this checklist in March. So now Jen is feeling pretty good about evaluation and I hope you are too. So we're gonna end it with one last question break to make sure that all of your initial questions and concerns about evaluation for your ATE proposal are answered. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll keep an eye on it right now. We don't have any questions tagged, but I'm sure people are entering them. Okay, yep, we have a couple coming in. <clears throat> Okay, our procurement process changes depending on the size of the contract. After a certain amount of time, it has to go to a, com to a competitive process. Yes, I think we, we find that somewhere. I know at our institution, that cap is $5,000. So looking at evaluation for multiple years, you're most likely looking at something that is above that monetary maximum. But again, uh, I wish we could provide some more prescriptive guidance on the procurement process, but it really is so unique to your institution. So I think someone who's either in your grants office, your procurement, whoever can help you kind of iron out what those policies are and what that, that hiring process will look like for you, they should be your first call. In fact, uh, I highly encourage you to reach out to them between now and our next webinar in March, because that'll be one of my first questions for you, because then you'll know who is going to write your evaluation plan, whether that is someone on your project team or whether you're going to be working with an external evaluator. Do you have other evaluation tools like the Evaluate UR and Evaluate UR Cure that we can look through? Yeah. 
So Evaluate You Are and Evaluate You Are Cure are two really wonderful tools that were developed by the ATE community that really focus on evaluating undergraduate research experiences. So that's what the U R is, undergraduate research. Um, and then the here is a classroom based undergraduate research experience, right? And so these tools are something that's free and available to you. So if you have an undergraduate research experience built into your project activities, you should absolutely go look at these uh, resources. So those resources in particular actually um, lay out what your indicators should be based on those specific activities. Uh, we're actually in the process of developing an ATE outcomes bank that will do something similar. So we'll say if you are looking at faculty professional development or if you're doing an internship, these are the types of metrics or indicators your evaluation could look at. Um, but given that that is not currently developed, we want to make sure that there is this flexibility that your evaluation is really being designed around what your project wants to know and what's needed within your context. Um, so not yet, but coming soon. And Evaluate does have a lot of different resources on our website. So if you go to the resource library and you're looking for outcomes or indicators specific to activities, go ahead and um, use those activities as search words and things should pop up. I appreciate that Donna is as excited about the outcomes bank as we are. That was three exclamation points to that's fantastic. <laughs> and right now we don't have any other questions. Um, if you have anything else that, you know, is kind of lingering in your mind, please feel free to pop it into the chat. Just give it a minute to make sure we've covered everything. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we used to do these two webinars actually in one hour together. Um, and it was so much information, particularly for folks who were new to writing a grant proposal and new to project evaluation. So I'm so glad that we split them up. But I also recognize that you're still in the beginning, right? You're still kind of figuring out what you're doing and what evaluation might mean for you. So uh, that might mean that you just don't have any questions this time. And that's perfectly okay. Because we'll see you again soon. Yes. Okay. So if you saw our wonderful slides, you would mm -hmm. say, well, Samantha's going to remind you of the webinar in March. Yes. Okay. So I did just put something in the chat. Um, we hope that you'll connect with us on LinkedIn. We do try to keep that um, a great spot to connect with us, uh, find out the most current information on upcoming events, evaluation resources, helpful tips and tricks. And then I also put the URL for our website in there. Um, you know, maybe that's something that would be helpful to have bookmarked. And we hope that both of those can be a source of knowledge and community for you as you move forward with your potential projects. Um, and then speaking of webinars, I just want to remind you to mark your calendars for the second webinar. Um, that will be on evaluation specifically for you, the Mentor Connect cohort. That is April 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And in this webinar, we'll be discussing detailed strategies and insights to develop evaluation plans for NSF ATE proposals. Um, March 27th. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, Lissa. That's an important amendment there. Don't show up on April 19th. It'll just be me. Um, so if you'd like Lissa and her evaluator expertise, March 27th at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, and we also have a feedback survey that we hope that you'll take a moment to fill out. Uh, we do really use these to improve uh, any webinars or resources that we create. And so we want to make sure that we're meeting your needs. Uh, and it just takes a minute. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you for your patience with our slide malfunction. Hopefully you're able to download the slides um, and see the remaining ones in the handout section. Look forward to seeing you in March. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions in the meantime.